we have to call the next hearing to be ready to start. Are we ready? Yes. Are we ready? Oh, yes, I'm on. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, we are starting our second hearing in this division, this room, uh, this morning, and it is on regulation of gun sales and social violence in the United States. We're happy to see there are United States here present. We were not certain whether they would be here, but we're very happy to see them and well-known faces. Um, <laughs> Andrew Stevenson and James Bishop from the US State Department. And we have um, for civil society participants from the Center for American Progress, Amnista Internacional, Harris Institute at Washington University, St. Louis, and Instituto Agarape. Agarape? Igarape. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, we shall, we've awarded time in this way, 15 minutes to civil society. Oh, this hearing was uh, called ex officio by the commission itself. Uh, 15 minutes to civil society, 15 minutes to the um, honorable uh, state um, of the United States, and 15 minutes to us which we hope we will not use all of, so that you can have some more minutes to do your final closing. Um, with that, I invite civil society to start, where I will be help assisting you with flags about time. So please start. Thank you. Hello. Okay. We would like to thank the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for organizing this hearing on regulation of gun sales and social violence in the United States. My name is Eugenio Weigen. I'm the Associate Director for the, for the gun, violence, gun Violence Policy Prevention Team at the Center for American Progress. I'm joined by Joel Martinez from the Center for American Progress, Ji Young Kim, as well as Nicole Smith from the Harris Institute at Washington University School of Law, Caterine Aguirre from Igarape, and Sik Johnson from Amnesty International. We are here to express our concerns on the level of gun violence in the United States as well as the level of U.S. firearms that have been used to commit crimes in other countries. First, I want to start by saying that we recognize that the, sec that the U.S. Second Amendment grants an individual right to own and possess a firearm. However, this does not mean that firearms cannot and should not be regulated. The United States is currently living a gun violence crisis. Evidence suggests that public mass shootings defined as incidents where four more people are fatally shot are deadlier and more frequent. While this incidence occurred every 172 days prior to 2011, since then they have occurred every 64 days. Just two weeks ago, a 19-year-old young man used an AR-15 rifle to fatally shoot 17 students at a Florida high school, injuring 14 more. These are extreme, but not isolated cases. These shootings have taken place in colleges, movie theaters, churches, and even elementary schools. However, mass shootings only indicate a small percentage of the problem. Every day, approximately 92 people are killed with a gun and another 219 are injured. The U.S. has a homicide rate that is 25 times higher than other developed countries, and young Americans are 82 times more likely to be murdered with a firearm than young people of other peer nations. Women within their homes are also vulnerable to gun violence in the United States. A study from the Center for American Progress found that more than 55% of intimate partner homicides of women are committed with a gun. Additionally, the country has an alarming rate of firearm suicide. 
Its rate is eight times higher than other developed countries, and on average, a firearm suicide occurs every 24 minutes. Moreover, firearms are stolen with high frequency in the United States. A 2017 study revealed that roughly 380,000 firearms are stolen every year. This is a major concern among law enforcement officers because stolen firearms end up being used in the commission of violent crimes. Another issue that deserves attention in this discussion is the fact that U.S. firearms can easily be diverted to secondary markets, nas nationally and internationally. From 2008 to 2016, more than 340,000 firearms were purchased in one U.S. state and were used to commit crimes in another state. In this regard, states with more permissive gun laws tend to legally export crime guns to other states. International gun trafficking is also alarming. A report from the Center for American Progress showed that from 2014 to 2016, more than 50,000 U.S. firearms were found in crimes in 15 countries in North America, Central America, and the Caribbean. This means that U.S. guns are being used to commit crimes in nearby countries every 31 minutes at the very least. While high levels of gun ownership in the United States play an important role on this crisis, we believe that to reduce the problem of gun violence and gun trafficking, weak gun laws must be addressed. For that, we have compiled a list of recommendations that will be offered at the end of our presentations. Good morning. The Harris World Law Institute at Washington University School of Law appreciates this opportunity to appear before the commission today. My name is Jian Kim, and I'm currently pursuing a Juris Doctorate degree at Washington University School of Law. I'm also an MD that has worked on the issue of gun violence from a public health perspective. I'm presenting our statement on behalf of our institute. Um, with me is my colleague, Nicole Smith, who is a key member of the project as well. We have a large team of researchers at the institute working on the question of gun violence under um, Professor Leila Sadat, the director of our institute, who deeply regrets that she cannot be, be here in person. As mentioned earlier, United States is in a crisis. Gun violence in our country has reached epidemic proportions. Mass shootings are happening with alarming frequency in schools, at concerts, and in theaters, creating a climate of fear and uncertainty. The recent Parkland school shooting is just the latest example of how the US government has failed to rein in gun violence. The most recent data available from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention indicates that more than 33,000 people die from gun-related injuries every year, which outstrips other countries by a very large margin. While the U.S. population only constitutes 4.4% of the world's population, 42% of civilian-owned guns in the world are found in the United States. This U.S. crisis is creating a pandemic as it is exacerbating gun violence in elsewhere in the Americas. In the United States, guns are regulated by both federal and state law. At the federal level, background checks are mandatory for gun purchases, but private sales are not covered by this law. Indeed, in spite of climbing fatality rates, federal gun laws have become increasingly lax, with the federal assault weapons ban expiring in 2004. Recent decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court have handicapped handicapped both state and federal efforts to enact stricter gun control laws, although even under these cases, an assault weapons ban would likely be constitutional. At the state level in the United States, although some states have enacted significant gun control laws, other states have moved the opposite direction, even adopting legislation allowing the carrying of concealed guns in public buildings. This is of great concern as a new legislation, the Concealed Carry Reciprocity Bill, that would require all states to honor concealed carry laws of other states is currently pending in the U.S. Senate. However, we know from the experience of other countries that gun control laws work to reduce fatalities. In Australia, since the implementation of the National Firearms Agreement in 1996, there has not been a single mass shooting. In the United Kingdom, which adopted two firearm laws in 1997, there were only a total of 32 gun homicides in 2012, compared to over 11,000 in the United States that year. As we note in our written statement, we believe this state of affairs may violate the right to life, liberty, security of person, right to right health, right to education, and right to take part in cultural life of the community found in the OAS Charter and the American Declaration. UN bodies, including the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the Human Rights Committee, have also expressed concern about the human rights issues raised by the gun violence epidemic in the United States. 
We request the Commission to act on our collective recommendations that will be made at the end of the, our presentations. We would also like to emphasize the issue of school shootings. Since 2013, there have been approximately 300 school shootings in the United States. This, the tragedy in Parkland should have never happened. The fact that our schools have become theaters of violence deserves your immediate attention. We would like to thank the Commission again for inviting us to appear at this hearing. Uh, thank you very much. Voy a hablar en español. El fracaso de las regulaciones de armas de fuego legales en Estados Unidos alimenta la violencia armada en América Latina. Mi nombre es Caterine Aguirre, soy colombiana y trabajo en el Instituto Igarapé localizado en Brasil. Agradezco profundamente la posibilidad de estar en esta audiencia. Me siento muy entusiasmada de haber sido invitada a ser parte de este selecto grupo de instituciones que trabajan en pro de la reducción de la violencia armada. Nuestra preocupación parte del hecho que Latinoamérica tiene los países y las ciudades con las tasas de homicidios más altas del mundo y también en la región con la mayor proporción de homicidios cometidos por arma de fuego. Violentos grupos asociados al tráfico de drogas, pandillas e individuos están fuertemente armados en la región y gran parte de este armamento y munición fue vendido legalmente por distribuidores con licencia federal en los Estados Unidos. Las limitaciones de las regulaciones en el comercio de armas de los Estados Unidos ha generado un gran mercado ilegal, incluyendo el provocado por los strawman purchases o compras de hombres de paja. Esta modalidad de tráfico implica que una persona compra a través de otra, o sea, el hombre de paja. Una investigación realizada por el, eh, la Universidad de San Diego y el Instituto Igarapé encontró que armas compradas libremente en Estados Unidos por los hombres de paja son la mayoría de las armas que fluyen en la región fronteriza entre Estados Unidos y México. Entre 2010 y 2012 se estima que aproximadamente 212 mil armas fueron adquiridas de esta manera en la frontera. Por otro lado, la mayoría de las armas incautadas en México son originarias de los Estados Unidos. Entre 2011 y 2016, el 70% de las armas incautadas por las autoridades mexicanas son originarias de este país. De la misma manera, un reporte del Center for American Progress encontró que entre 2014 y 2016, más de 50.000 armas originarias de los Estados Unidos han sido encontradas en 15 países en todo el continente, como parte de investigaciones criminales. Se identifica que un 49% de las armas asociadas a delitos en El Salvador vienen de Estados Unidos, así como el 45% de las armas en Honduras y el 29% en Guatemala y grandes porcentajes en el Caribe. Mapa, por favor. Como mayor, aquí vamos a mostrar una herramienta que tenemos en el Instituto Igarapé que se llama Mapping Arms Data. Entonces, aquí podemos ver la información de tráfico legal, de, de comercio legal de armas entre los países. Ahí vemos, por ejemplo, lo que está exportando Colombia de Azul, eh, eh, exportando en amarillo e import, eh, importando en azul. Eh, clica, por favor, en Estados Unidos. Como el mayor exportador e importador de armas en el mundo, los Estados Unidos desempeñan un papel desproporcionado en facilitar el suministro continuo de armas al resto de las Américas. Luego de México, las armas se mueven con facilidad a países como los del Triángulo Norte de Centroamérica, El Salvador, Honduras y Guatemala, los cuales tienen las tasas de homicidio más altas del mundo. Estos países están sumidos en una profunda crisis causada por grupos de crimen organizado, incluyendo las maras o las pandillas. Medidas como un muro entre los Estados Unidos y México tendrían un impacto insignificante en el tráfico de armas de estos países. Solo a través de medidas como el fortalecimiento de las verificaciones de antecedentes, la criminalización de los strawman purchases, la existencia de acuerdos bilaterales, la generación de transparencia en la información y el desarrollo de una base de datos de incautaciones podría generar impactos en la reducción de la dimensión del tráfico. Esto pasa también por la ratificación del Tratado de Comercio de Armas. El Instituto Igarapé adhiere a las recomendaciones propuestas conjuntamente por las instituciones aquí presentes, presentadas al final de este espacio. Los Estados Unidos han sido negligentes en la prevención del tráfico de armas. Las víctimas no son solamente ciudadanos de los Estados Unidos, sino de toda América Latina. Gracias. Hello, I'm Zeke Johnson with Amnesty International USA. Thank you for this important hearing. As detailed in our written submission to the Commission, gun violence is a human rights crisis in the United States, and the U.S. government is failing to meet its human rights obligations to save lives. As noted earlier, on average, 92 people in the United States are killed with firearms every day. 
Six of those deaths each day are children. In the first 45 days of this year, 1,806 people have died from gun violence in the United States. 331 teenagers have been shot or killed. And there have been 11 shootings in schools that resulted in death or injury. Mass shooting incidents like the recent tragedy in Florida are horrific, yet it is important to highlight that gun violence in the US is a daily epidemic that disproportionately impacts people of color, children, and women. The US is failing to protect women from the misuse of guns by private individuals in the domestic violent co violence context due to gaps and loopholes under federal law. Where protections and firearm-related safeguards do exist, they are often not enforced. These deaths are preventable, as women are often attacked by someone they know, and often that person has a history of violent behavior. The disparate impact of gun violence on communities of color is particularly troubling in the context of its long-lasting and life-altering effects, and the way in which it compounds the socioeconomic challenges of already marginalized minority communities. While discriminatory divides and inequities are found in many areas of life in the United States, nowhere is it more prevalent than in the impact of gun violence which is in many ways symptomatic of a host of other discriminatory factors, leading to African Americans being 10 times more likely to be the victims of gun homicides than white Americans. Gun violence particularly impacts youth of color and is the leading cause of death among black males ages 15 to 34. The US government has clear international human rights obligations to protect people from gun violence, including a positive obligation of due diligence to prevent violations of the right to life by taking measures to combat actual or foreseeable threats to that right. Such measures have been urged for many years by impacted communities and could be relatively easily implemented by the state, and yet the US continues to fail to meet its human rights obligations to save lives. In light of this human rights crisis, the organizations represented at this hearing respectfully request the commission to conduct a follow-up hearing with survivors, families of victims, and representatives of impacted communities in the US and draft a report on gun violence in the US, including best practices on how the US can meet its obligations under international law. Additionally, the organizations represented here request the commission to urge the US government to implement a range of human rights compliant reforms without delay, including the following. Funding research into gun violence prevention as a public health issue and removing legislative barriers to such funding, including the Dickey Amendment, enacting universal background check legislation to set a minimum standard across the country to ensure firearms are not accessed by individuals at risk of misusing them, passing legislation that protects survivors of domestic violence and prevents abusers from accessing guns, funding evidence-based locally run gun violence prevention programs, including by passing the Youth Promise Act, enacting laws that require safe storage of firearms to protect against child access, banning so-called assault weapons, modifications that allow rapid firing, high capacity magazines, and armor piercing ammunition, implementing measures to reduce the number of stolen firearms, ending so-called straw purchases, ratifying and implement implementing the arms trade treaty, rejecting proposals that are likely to lead to more deaths, such as arming teachers and the concealed carry reciprocity bill currently before the US Senate, and finally, ensuring that the full range of human rights of communities most impacted by gun violence are respected, protected, and fulfilled without discrimination, including full access to basic services such as healthcare, education, food, water, and sanitation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I now invite the United um, representatives of the United States to um, make their submissions. Thank you very much. Distinguished commissioners, colleagues at the other table, the secretariat of the commission, I am Andrew Stevenson of the US Mission to the Organization of American States, and I'm here with James Bischoff of the US Department of State's Office of the Legal Advisor to represent our delegation at our hearings today. I would first like to extend the thanks of the United States government to the government of Colombia for hosting us and other OAS member states that are attending this period of sessions. We commend Colombia for its commitment to human rights, both here at home and across the hemisphere. And we also commend you, Commissioner McCauley, on your recent election as president of the commission. And we look forward to continuing to work with you as US Rapporteur and on behalf of the entire commission. I will turn the floor over to Mr. Bischoff to give some remarks specific to the subject of this hearing for in a, in a few moments. Before I do so, however, I would first like to echo the condolences of President Trump, Vice, Vice President Pence, 
Florida Governor Rick Scott, and other political leaders in the United States over the tragic shooting in Parkland, Florida on February 14th. We mourn for those who lost their lives. The federal government is working closely with Florida state authorities to investigate the shooting, and it is our understanding that the Florida authorities are proceeding with criminal charges against the alleged perpetrator. Next, I will take a few moments to convey the serious concerns of my government about the commission's decision to convene this hearing and the next one this morning. Just over a month ago, the commission sent the United States notification of its decision to hold these hearings. This one on regulation of gun sales and social violence, and the next one on temporary protected status and deferred action for childhood arrivals. In those notifications, the commission said that it was convening these hearings on its own initiative, presumably under Article 61 of its rules. We also understand that they are intended to be hearings of a general nature or thematic hearings governed by Article 66 of the rules. Increasingly in recent years, the commission seems to have made it standard practice to insert itself into ongoing domestic political discussions through the mechanism of a thematic hearing. The subjects on which the commission convenes thematic hearings are often complex, fast changing, the subject of significant domestic litigation or congressional consideration, and also of great political sensitivity. This can make it very difficult for the United States to meaningfully engage with the commission about them and reduces the value of the commission's involvement. The commission is well aware of our similar longstanding concerns about the practice of convening thematic hearings about matters in active litigation in our domestic system. As we have repeatedly told the commission, we cannot discuss specific details on such matters while the outcome of litigation is pending. It was in part for these reasons that we found ourselves unable to participate in the March 2017 hearings at all. The number of thematic hearings has risen sharply in recent years and now dwarfs the number of petition-based hearings, even as the commission's backlog of petitions continues to grow and undermine its overall effectiveness. Since 1996, the commission has convened 90 hearings involving the United States. From 1996 through 2011, Petition-based hearings represented 75% of all hearings, with the Commission holding 34 petition-based hearings in just 13 thematic hearings. By contrast, from 2012 to the present, the Commission has convened just eight petition-based hearings, contrasted with 35 thematic hearings, meaning that thematic hearings have represented over 80% of all hearings in the past six years. For the United States, with, we understand the Commission's desire to provide its views on important issues of the day, but the disproportionate between thematic and petition-based hearings leads directly into a larger problem of increasing concern to the United States. The Commission has been expending an inordinate amount of its limited resources, involving itself in high-profile and sensitive ongoing domestic political discussions, instead of taking decisive action to address the severe and growing backlog of individual petitions. As a strong supporter of the Commission, and by far the hemisphere's largest financial contributor, we are concerned that the Commission is operating outside of its mandate and not focusing on its limited resources as it should. For the United States alone, there are nearly 100 cases open on the Commission's docket, and the vast majority of the open cases action lies with the Commission to make a decision. Newly opened cases are typically at least five years old by the time the Commission is able to send them to the United States for a response. The backlog continues to grow because the number of petitions received in any given year far exceeds the number of decisions per year. The Commission usually issues one or two merits decisions per year involving the United States, typically many years after the events being complained about. The Commission's statistic website, statistics website indicates much larger numbers for other OAS member states such as Mexico, Colombia, and Peru. Although we applaud the recent efforts to streamline case management, you face a monumental task simply in addressing the current cases before you. The Commission's strength and credibility in our region depends on its ability to operate effectively and efficiently in a constrained budgetary environment. It must demonstrate to states, civil society, and individuals that is, it is an efficient and effective institution. The severe backlog of individual petitions, 
and the long amount of time that elapses between the filing of a petition and a case ultimate res resolution significantly diminishes this perception. To be sure, dealing with individual petitions is tedious, requires examination of alleged abuses that occurred years ago, and occurs mostly out of public view. But as of course you appreciate, it is indispensable work of which many individuals around the hemisphere hang their hopes. In sharp contrast, the topics to be discussed at the hearings today are not the subject of a petition before the commission, nor do they lack full and transparent debate and consideration at all relevant domestic and judicial fora in the United States. They were instead convened at the commission's own initiative, using a rarely invoked provision of the rules with respect to the United States. We understand that you may disagree with the views we have set forth. We respect your independence and will, of course, listen to your point of view and that of civil society. Nevertheless, it remains the position of my government that the commission should not have convened hearings on these issues, especially absent a petition. Each time the commission convenes another thematic hearing on a hotly contested political issue that is the subject of domestic robust debate in domestic institutions or as a matter of domestic active litigation, the United States finds itself reevaluating the utility of participating in hearings. Despite these concerns, we ultimately decided it was important to be here to relate our concerns to you and to convey our desire to continue this discussion in Washington at a mutually convenient time. Turning now to the topic of this hearing, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Jay Bischoff. Jay. Thanks, Andrew. <coughs> Thank you. Distinguished commissioners, good morning. My name is James Bischoff, and today I will discuss the commission's lack of competence to consider the domestic regulation of firearms and private violence perpetrated by firearms. I will then discuss the constitutional right to bear arms in the United States, the U.S. laws and regulations on firearms, and prosecutions of those who violate gun laws. As provided under Article 20 of its statute, the Commission has the competence to examine allegations that the United States, which has not chosen to ratify the American Convention on Human Rights, has failed to live up to its commitments in the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man. As is indicated on the placard behind you, this year marks the 70th anniversary of the Declaration, a proud moment the Commission is celebrating in this period of sessions. It was truly a groundbreaking instrument that set forth, months before the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, key human rights commitments that states of the Americas undertook voluntarily to respect as well as duties that individuals owe toward one another and to society, such as the duty to obey the law. Many of the Declaration's rights reflected rights contained in our own Constitution's Bill of Rights, another groundbreaking document at the time of its adoption. Despite the importance of the Declaration as a statement of moral and political commitments, the commitments in it are, in the United States' longstanding view, non-binding. By the same token, the Commission has recommendatory but not binding powers, as the terms of the Commission statute make clear, in particular in Articles 18 and 20. We, of course, understand that the Commission and the Inter-American Court take the view that the Declaration is a source of legal obligation. Yet, while we have great respect for the Commission and the Court, the United States has never accepted this view and it is not bound by it as a matter of international law. While we recognize the good intentions of those who would wish the Declaration had binding force, it would seriously undermine the process of international lawmaking by which sovereign states voluntarily undertake specified legal obligations to impose legal obligations on states where no obligation has been accepted through some form of ipse dixit. But this is precisely how this jurisprudence originated in the Commission's baby boy decision in 1981, backed up by the court in a 1989 advisory opinion. Contrary to the Commission and the Court's assertions in those two decisions and in others, it is not the case that states that negotiated and ratified the OAS Charter or its amendments, or the states that adopted the Commission statute, intended the Commission to apply the American Declaration as a binding source of international law. This basic fact holds true no matter how many times the Commission restates the view that the Declaration has binding force, and it does so frequently. But as far as we're aware, neither the Commission nor the Court has ever seriously reconsidered the legal reasoning underlying this view. Nevertheless, we continue to make our objections known. As a sovereign state, the United States voluntarily undertakes its international law obligations, and it takes those obligations seriously. 
and we have never undertaken an obligation that would render the Declaration binding. And we have persistently objected to any such notion since at least 1979. In sum, the Declaration remains, after 70 years, one of the key blueprints for the protection and promotion of human rights in the Americas. But as a matter of international law, it also remains non-binding, just as those who negotiated and adopted it 70 years ago intended. While the United States and the Commission disagree on this basic issue, we always do so in a spirit of respectful dialogue. Turning now to the substance of the Declaration and the topic of this hearing, there is no article in the Declaration addressing the right of individuals to bear arms, in contrast to the United States Constitution, where, as our friends at the other table mentioned, the right is set forth in the Second Amendment of our Constitution. The constitutional right to bear arms is the starting point for any discussion of firearms in the United States. Furthermore, the Declaration is silent on any right to be free from private violence, including violence inflicted by firearms. More broadly, as we have explained in numerous submissions over the years, the United States does not recognize that OAS member states, by pledging support for the Declaration or by joining subsequent OAS instruments, undertook a commitment, much less an obligation under international law, to prevent private violence. Those who unjustifiably use guns against other individuals certainly fail to respect their duty to obey the law. But there is no provision in the Declaration or in the other governing instruments of the Commission that would permit such private conduct to be imputed to the state. Of course, as a matter of domestic law and policy, the United States government takes very seriously its responsibility to prevent and punish crime. However, as a matter of international human rights, Questions of private gun violence and states' regulation of firearms and states' actions to address private violence lie beyond the Commission's competence to consider. Despite this lack of competence, I will briefly discuss for the Commission's benefit some aspects of the U.S. domestic legal regime related to the right to bear arms and firearm regulation. As noted above, the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution states that, quote, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, unquote. This right has been explained by the U.S. Supreme Court in the case of District of Columbia versus Heller as, quote, guaranteeing the individual right to possess and carry weapons, unquote. The court has also held that this right extends to, quote, all instruments that constitute bearable arms, even those that were not in existence at the time of the founding of the United States, unquote. The Second Amendment means that governments at all levels of our federal system are prohibited from outright banning ownership, possession, and sale of firearms, because to do so would run afoul of the constitutional right to bear arms. However, the existence of the right does not mean that governments are powerless to regulate firearms sale and possession. As the Supreme Court has also recognized, Governments may lawfully impose prohibitions on the possession of firearms by, for example, felons and the mentally ill. Governments may also, as two more examples given by the Supreme Court, forbid the carrying of firearms in schools or government buildings and impose conditions on the commercial sale of arms. Both federal and state laws address firearms possession and use, and the federal government has recently undertaken a number of important efforts to ensure that violent offenders, including those who criminally misuse firearms, are held accountable. In March 2017, Attorney General Sessions sent a memorandum to the Depart to Department of Justice prosecutors ordering them to prioritize cases against the most violent offenders, those who are driving the violence in the most violent places in the United States. In October, he reinvigorated the department's project Safe Neighborhoods Program, directing federal prosecutors to partner with law enforcement at all levels of government, along with the communities they serve to develop localized plans to reduce violent crime. In 2017, federal prosecutors brought cases against the greatest number of violent criminals in at least a quarter century, the most since the department began tracking a violent crime category and they prosecuted more defendants on federal firearms charges than they have in a decade. Distinguished commissioners, that concludes our presentation today. We look forward to your comments. Thank you.
Um, I thank you very much um, for that, the, your comments, and um, which we find very interesting. And um, part of your comment is part of your usual response um, to our proceedings. Um, and you do admit that we can autonomously decide how to conduct our work, which is to promote respect for the human rights of all persons in this hemisphere and to protect, seek to protect those lives of all these peoples in this hemisphere. Um, this hearing was called because of our in-depth in concern about the loss of life of persons in America um, through the use of guns, and guns of a particular caliber, which should be used in arenas of war and not in schools and on the streets of any country, any state in the world. And in our hemisphere, it, we considered it our duty to try and seek information on, this, on how this was um, continuing in America. And um, I, um, we, we do believe that we have the, the right, based on the charter of the OAS, to make these, have these hearings, and have this particular hearing about the United States gun laws and, and the loss of life of the peoples in America as a result of, of it. And in fact, it might assist your state that you, you hear from civil society what their views are on this matter. Indeed, the young people of the high school in Florida have been articulate, extremely articulate in their protests following the shooting, which we are bore and which we sympathize with and the families who survived those who were killed. And we also have noted that you say there's legal provision um, um, prohibiting guns in schools, yet the head of your state has um, stated that teachers should be armed with guns which I must admit that I personally thought was the most dangerous suggestion that could come from anyone. Uh, because what would the teachers do with the guns, especially when the children are in class? Would they just leave it on the desk in case somebody comes in to shoot? And what, how do you prevent children from picking it up? I, I, I couldn't understand such a, a suggestion, but I'm happy to hear that there is legal prohibition for the use of school, um, uh, guns in schools. Um, in relation to how we conduct our affairs, we do and we do have a strategic plan which has taken a great deal of effort to produce. And on that plan, we believe that we will better be able to conduct the affairs of the commission. And we're making assiduous efforts to be successful in clearing up the backlog, which we all know exists within the commission, and to be current in all the applications that are made to it in relation to the violations of human rights. And um, we trust that in years, recent years to come, the immediate years to come, you will see the results of these works. And we look forward to having discussions with you in, the, in Washington as you suggest and would happily accept such an invitation because it will only help uh, our processes um, to do so. Um, that being said, I now invite um, the first vice president to speak um, on the issue of this hearing. El problema de esta audiencia, dice Margaret. Yes, eh, mi, mi agradecimiento a la sociedad civil por eh, la participación y el planteamiento que se nos hace. A la ilustre representación del Estado de Estados Unidos, eh, sí debo expresar que el trabajo que realiza la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos 
tiene un norte bajo eh, principios, eh, bajo normativa y sustentada en la protección de la vida, la integridad, la eh, libertad, la seguridad de todos los ciudadanos del continente y de la región del Caribe. Eh, estamos comprometidos con ese mandato y haremos todos los esfuerzos para que eh, lo podamos lograr con la mayor eficiencia y efectividad posible. Para el tema de la audiencia, yo eh, solo tendría que eh, precisar, o, o no quiero hacer un, un, una pregunta porque... Eh, Aquí se ha dicho que eh, el, el Estado no tiene una obligación de, de, de entrar a hacer una explicación porque esto es un asunto de carácter doméstico. Eh, pero el, la, la propuesta de, eh, un, de la protección del derecho a la vida vinculado con lo que significa eh, el uso, la, la, el derecho a portar armas para defenderse. Eh, el tema es que los, en, en el último acontecimiento los chicos no tuvieron un arma para defenderse y ojalá no podamos darle armas para defenderse. Lo que tenemos que dar es otras cosas para, para garantizar su, su desarrollo y su crecimiento. Eh, pero, ¿cuál es el, la, la, la explicación que podemos eh, encontrar en, 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 esta, en esta posición de que las armas eh, son para defenderse y que el derecho, eh, ese es un derecho? Eh, pero, pero yo quisiera eh, eh, concluir mi, mi participación eh, con un reconocimiento a la voz de los adolescentes. Yo como relatora de los derechos de la niñez del continente, eh, escuchar la voz de los adolescentes levantada para exigir la protección de sus vidas y la vida de sus compañeros. Eso es un mensaje que tenemos que evaluar y ojalá... Eh, todas las organizaciones eh, le den los espacios de participación a, las, a los adolescentes y las adolescentes por la fuerza que su voz tiene. Gracias. Thank you. Um, first Vice President, I now invite the second Vice President to speak. Sí, gracias, Presidenta. Realmente es muy breve porque estamos mal de tiempo pero me uno a los agradecimientos que ya se han vertido a la presencia de las partes. Eh, muy importante la propuesta que nos han hecho de la sociedad civil, creo que la acogemos, de que ojalá podamos hacer un registro detallado de las víctimas que han ocurrido y ojalá y la publicación de esta sirva para hacer pues, una, un, un debate para que se mantenga este que ya ha empezado. La presencia del Estado de los Estados Unidos es muy importante. Me parece que tenemos que agradecerla de manera muy particular y mucho más si tienen eh, puntos de vista distantes, diferentes a los nuestros. Me parece que eso enriquece muchísimo eh, la actividad nuestra, la dialéctica, pero fundamentalmente legitima esa presencia, legitima tanto a la OEA, la Organización de los Estados Americanos, como al sistema interamericano mismo. Ojalá y siempre, de verdad, que invitáramos a Estados Unidos estuviera presente, porque el sistema de protección de derechos realmente se fortalece muchísimo. Sí, eh, sentimos y hacemos ver que Estados Unidos sí participa y que sí hace parte realmente de este sistema. De manera que eh, es una cuestión de culturas, por supuesto que allá existe la segunda enmienda que les permite el uso de las armas en la manera de la adquisición de las armas.
pero para nosotros, los latinoamericanos, sí tenemos la idea de que las armas deberían ser patrimonio exclusivo de eh, los ejércitos institucionales y que cuando estos los usen tengan que estar sujetos a una severa observancia crítica de las sociedades para que esa utilización tenga muchísimo de, de manejo por la proporcionalidad de las armas, de, 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 de la utilización de las armas. Es, es todo, pero realmente sí son visiones distintas que nacen de las culturas y de las, de las constituciones políticas eh, que respetamos. Gracias. Um, thank you, for, um, Second Vice President. I now invite Commissioner Flavio to um, speak. Thank you so much, our President. Um, I just would like to have two comments. First, to express our gratitude in having civil society and in having the state representatives here in this session welcoming all the valuable contributions and all the very consistent uh, information. And my first comment is about the lack of competence of our Inter-American Commission. Actually, our mandate is under Article 41 of the American Convention, and our mandate is to safeguard Inter-American um, standards uh, in the defense and protection and promotion of human rights. So, um, as we have here, the American Declaration of Human Rights, that's the US, um, and we are happy that uh, sign. What is under the table here is the gun policy and the risk of the right to life and freedom and even the clause of equality and non-discrimination that is provided under Article 2. So that's why our commission made the choice of prioritizing this 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 topic and uh, because we think the gun violence the gun policy is a human rights problem is causing systematically um, the um, is causing systematically the violation of right to life on many many all the data that we heard here so uh, we do believe we know that the Constitution, the Second Amendment, provide the right to carry gu guns, but we do insist, we do believe that we have to think about on the monitoring, controlling, and regulating properly this right in order to save lives and to save um, the inter-American standards. Our work is guided by the safeguard of inter-American standards. So I think it's a very important moment here, uh, and our role is to contribute to the human rights protection, to the human rights, uh, especially children who are among the victims. I would just add the date of the, inter -Ameri the American Journal of Medicine, and we couldn't be silent, we couldn't be indifferent to this data that um, the US alone is among among two dozen of world's wealthiest nations, the U.S. alone accounts for 91% of firearms deaths among children under 14 years. So I think this called our attention among many other data, all what happened, and this is a constructive dialogue. That's the proposal, a constructive dialogue that we could have the diagnosis. We can try to make a contribution to change uh, this pattern of human rights um, um, concern. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, th thank you very much. Um, because we are running short of time, I will make closing comments after you have had your closing comments. Um, we have uh, five minutes each, and that will give me about three minutes for the next hearing to, to start. So. If you could be yes, thank you. I'm going to be very brief. Um, I want to just highlight that our recommendations here do not infringe on the Second Amendment at all. Second of all, most of our recommendations are not only supported by, by students in Florida, but by the general population in the United States. Just to give you an example, 97% of people in the US support universal background checks. 67% of US population support the banning of assault weapons. Uh, furthermore, we know that this gone, uh, the, our recommendations do work. 
Again, just to give you a couple examples, public health approach on cars worked. The, the death of uh, related to vehicle accidents has significantly dropped in the United States, and we would like that to be implemented uh, in gun violence as well. And universal background checks. There's evidence that suggests that states that do implement it present significantly lower rates of gun suicide, significantly lower rates of intimate partner gun homicides, and police officers fatally shot with, with a firearm. Yes, thank you. Um, I also um, echo everything uh, my colleague said and the recommendations that we um uh, we collectively um, came up with at the end, end. And I also thank the commission's attention to the school shootings and the children that we are deeply concerned about uh, ourselves as well, as I um, stated in my statement. And um, in addition, um, we would also um, appreciate if the commission would conduct a study on gun violence in the U.S. with a special focus on um, school shootings as, um, as it was um, raised by the commission um, itself. Thank you. On my side, I only I am going to add that it's not only a domestic issue. As we have shown, the arms flow to Latin America, to Central America, that is the region with the highest homicide rate. So it matters for the region. And the Caribbean. And the Caribbean. <laughs> I would just like to emphasize that this is, in fact, a human rights issue, and the U.S. government does, in fact, have binding human rights obligations to address this issue and to respect, protect, and fulfill the right to life. There are a range of measures that have been shown to be effective, and it's puzzling why the U.S. government wouldn't want to implement, implement these measures to help save lives. The measures that we've articulated today are not in conflict with the Second Amendment, and as the representatives of the state acknowledged, the Second Amendment does have qualifications that can be put in place. And so it's absolutely a binding obligation to put those uh, measures in place as soon as possible to meet the government's obligations. Thank you. The U United States representatives, please. Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, just a comment on two issues, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Jay. Uh, with respect to the strategic plan, I think the, the new five-year plan is very important. The United States has engaged in various dialogues with civil society in Washington, also in the region, and with you. It's a huge step forward in terms of generating the necessary resources to prioritize addressing the case backlog. Very important progress has been made on that. We will continue to support that. You know that we're in a dialogue to uh, link our forthcoming assistance for the Commission to the work of the strategic plan. We're very aligned uh, in wanting to work with you to ensure it's fully implemented. Uh, in support um, or in dialogue with donors, including the private sector. We know that that's one area where the Commission has work to do in terms of engagement with the private sector, with foundations. We're willing to continue to work with you to try to strengthen that relationship, especially with respect to public-private partnerships. That's a new area for the Commission that we'd like to stress. Um, very briefly, in terms of the new units of the Commission, in terms of memory, truth, also in terms of economic, cultural, and social rights. There are linkages to many of these issues that we've talked about. We would welcome the chance to talk about how these new units of the commission can perhaps engage on some of these issues uh, of interest to the United States across our spectrum of engagement with the commission. Very briefly, in terms of Central America in particular, I'm happy to share with you um, and also with members of civil society the work that we're doing as part of the U.S. strategy for engagement in Central America. Uh, we're very active in terms of various pillars in that strategy which, foc which focus on promoting prosperity, enhancing security, and improving governance. I'm happy to share our strategies, our efforts on that front, which contain strong support from the various highest levels of the U.S. government um, for our engagement, not only in Northern Triangle, but also throughout the, uh, the entirety of Central America. Jay? <clears throat> Thanks. In the one minute that I have, um, I will... I'll, I'll just, you know, I, 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 we've listened very carefully to what you've had to say. I, I just have to reiterate, you know, it's our position that um, questions about private gun violence and states' regulation of them are, in our view, beyond the commission's competence. But we would, you know, refer back to our to the, to the points that I made earlier um, uh, for our full argument about the commission's competence and what it does include and what it does not include. There's, there's some details in there. Um, and also about our obligations or lack thereof with respect to private violence. Um, I would just note also that you know, the pre precise contours of laws regulating guns, very, they're, they're limited by the Second Amendment, but otherwise they're determined by democratic uh, processes and legislatures across our federal system. And so they vary greatly from state to state, state to federal government, and other, the other jurisdictions 
of our federal government. So if you'd like to know more about that, there's a lot of publicly available information about, about what exact types of things are regulated where and, 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 um, and what the differences are. Thanks. Thank you very, very much. Um, I just um, wish to reiterate the fact that one of our most important mandates is to try to protect and secure the lives of all citizens in the hemisphere. Without life, you cannot enjoy any right. And, and that is a fundamental requirement of our mandate and that we should promote uh, um, all standards related to the enjoyment of the human rights of all persons in the Americas. We have, I have to state this, I do thank you for bringing this matter to our attention. As far as we know, knew and know, there is no um, current uh, uh, case ongoing, a trial ongoing on this matter and and with so I am happy to see that you are here and that your only absence from a hearing was based on the fact that a matter was sub uh, um, that not being the case in this instance it is good that you're here because it always enriches the discussion um, that one has in these hearings when the state appears and participates I thank um, you all for being here and bringing this matter to us and I hope you will send us more information and I'm sure the this, this United States as well will send um, whatever they deem appropriate. Um, I think it is implicit in the position the United States holds in the world to be a perfect example, as perfect as humankind can be, um, for, to respect the lives of humans. And, and um, it is a glaring uh, um, lack of the number of lives lost through the use of guns. I was fortunate enough to attend school in England when no policeman on the street had a gun in hand, never. And there was no shooting by police or anybody, uh, um, of anyone, in all the years I was there and went on to university. But this is because of the basic belief that the police were peace officers and ought not to be armed. And because of that, the citizens were not armed either. There are a few incidents over the years since, uh, since I've left there, but I think the record is clear that countries which have strict gun laws the citizens are safer. Their lives are more protected. And this is the reason why the commission thought it appropriate to have this hearing, to bring that, those kinds of matters to the attention of the United States so that you can consider how you can amend your legal position in order to protect more lives. This, and this is inherent in our mandate for us to do. I thank you again for coming here. I thank you too for being here. And I hope we can protect more lives in the future. Thank you, this hearing is at an end. In eight minutes.